Well, good morning, children of love. Thank you. Welcome to our homecoming celebration for this year. It is so good to see you all here. Thank you so much. If you are uh, not a member of this church, if you are from Lebanon Church, or if you are not a member of either of these churches, we thank you for being here. It's special to us that you have come and that you are part of the service. So thank you, thank you very much, very much. I want to, as I welcome you, I want to begin our service with a great hymn. I'm going to ask you to turn in your hymnals to number 98, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Father, your people have gathered together on this very special day. We have gathered to worship you. We've gathered, Lord, because we love you so much. And we've gathered, Lord, because we want to sing indeed to God be the glory, great things he has done. And we not only thank you for the great things you have done, but we stand here before you this morning, Lord, thanking you for the great things that you're still going to be doing in our lives for the wonderful ways that you are going to continue every day to bless us. So, Lord, we heard in our opening song, there's nothing that can change the way that you love us. And, Lord, we just love you as well. So accept our worship this morning. Accept our worship as we come to you and we kneel before you and we adore you and we show you our love. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Consider the lilies that on toil nor spin. 
And there's not a king more splendor than them. Consider the sparrow, they don't plant nor sow, but they're fed by the master who watches them grow. With eyes full of wonder and a heart full of love. He really cares when your head is bowed low. Consider the lilies and the Introduce you to a friend of mine who hangs out the stars, tells the sun when to shine, and kisses the flowers each morning with dew. Oh, but he is not too busy. I've decided that when she goes on the road, I'm going to be her manager. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. One of the things that we do on Sunday morning is we bring our tithes and offerings to God. It's easy to write a check and send it to the church. That's easy. But we do it during our worship service because it's an act of praise. And obviously, because of all the COVID restrictions, we're not able to do it like we're used to. But we do have an offering plate on the right side in the foyer as you go out. And if you would like to leave tithes or offerings there for God, we would, we would encourage you to do that as you leave. We thank you for your support and for, for giving to God through our church. Um, as I've said before, we, throughout all of this COVID issues, we have been able to maintain the ministry commitments that we have made, and we have ministry co commitments literally around the world, and we have been able to meet them because of you, because you have been willing to give to God, and so thank you for that. We just want to acknowledge that and, uh, and to uh, remind you that the plate is in the right as you go out, and you can leave them there. Okay, well, let's, let's take a few moments and center our hearts and our minds on joining together in prayer to our God. Almighty God, as we gather on this beautiful homecoming Sunday, we thank you, Lord, that your light shines not only in each of our lives every day, but your light is also shining throughout the entire world. In a universe of twinkling stars and of fireflies glow, and even in the beautiful luminescence of the river and the bay, all, the na all of nature invites us to every day enjoy you and the peace of your presence with us. Lord, we thank you for all those who have gathered here for worship this morning. Some folks live close by and others may have traveled for a ways to be here, but, but to enjoy this day of homecoming. 
And we thank you, Lord, for bringing us together as one family this morning. And we thank you that no matter where we may live, whether near or far, we are still one family in you, the family of Christ. So we thank you for this time of worship this morning. And especially in a little while when we come to your table of Holy Communion. Because we know that indeed you will meet us and that your presence will certainly calm our spirits. Lord, we know that there are times in our lives when you reach out and stir the deepest places within us, inspiring us to dare new things and to trust you in new ways. And Lord, we know that it is at your table where we celebrate the pure grace you have offered us in Jesus Christ, the one who lived and died, who broke the bonds of the tomb, and who offers us new life. Yet we're also aware, Lord, of the concerns that we lay before you today. For those who are struggling to set aside worry and begin to trust in you. For those who are wrestling with a decision that seems much too unclear. For the ones who may be reaching the end of life and who need reconciliation with you and with those they love. For those who seek to grow deeper in their walk with you and need your wisdom. And Lord, for this world and all of the suffering that seems to be everywhere these days. We ask you today, Lord, to break through with your kingdom in every situation where you are needed. And Lord, help us as well. Help us to let go of all those things that you call us to surrender. And teach us to walk with you and to to work with you as we learn to trust in the unforced rhythms of your grace. Lord, we are grateful for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ for the death that set us free and for the love that transforms us and for the hope that clearly inspires us. And so now we bring our prayers to you as we praise your holy name. We bring them in the name of our risen Lord and Savior who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now we have a video from the West Coast College Choir. And this song, this song is awesome. Listen to the words. It's called The Blood. Well, our scripture comes today from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 28 through 30. So let's hear the word of God. Therefore, there is now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, over many years of talking with folks, 
primarily church folks, okay, I have found that many people are afraid or just will not talk openly about what God has done for them or their relationship with God. And I find that's true even in the church with other Christians. Uh, we'll talk about everything else. We'll talk about all kinds of stuff. But we will not share or be open to talk about our personal faith. You ever find that? I mean, think about you talked to your friends this morning when you got here. Did you talk about the things of God or did you say, hey, how you doing? Great day. What a beautiful weather. It's great to be with everybody. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's just normal. It's what we do. But when that happens, you see, the, you know, there are times when we find ourselves judging these folks and their level of faith. You know, if this person really believed, they'd talk about their faith. If this person wasn't so complacent about their faith, they'd be sharing it with others. I mean, you know something? That kind of judgments, those kinds of statements are not necessarily true. And you know that as well, I, as, well as I do. Now, I will admit, <laughs> there are some people that if you see them during the week, you'll have a real tough time finding ev any evidence of their faith, you know. And there are also others who are content to sit in church for an hour on Sunday morning and do nothing else to live out their faith openly in their homes or in their jobs or in their communities. However, I've also learned, I have also learned that most people in the church today, most of them, do believe in God. They do truly love the Lord. They do truly want to serve Him, except for their damaged, what I call spiritual self-image. We, spiritu we have damaged our spiritual self-image because the people's feelings of unworthiness and guilt and shame that actually prevents people from living out their faith and from sharing their faith every day anew. Oh, these folks, they, they know God is faithful to them. They know that God loves them. They know that the Holy Spirit is with them every day. But because of things that have happened in their past and because they've been judged by other people mainly unfairly and because they've been taught many times even in the church and many times even from the pulpits that no matter what you're doing, you got to do better because the way you are, you're not good enough for God. You ever heard that? I heard that a lot when I was growing up. I heard that a lot in my early years before coming into ministry. Uh, I, I think I've shared that story with you. Barbara and I were living in Fredericksburg, and we went to a church, and we went about four or five weeks, and every Sunday was basically the same message. The pastor didn't say this, but it was the same thing. No matter what you are, you're not good enough yet. you got to do better. And I remember coming out of the church that sun, the last Sunday we were there and looked at Barbara and said, you know, I know I'm not the best person in the world, and I'm not probably the strongest Christian in the world, but somehow I don't think I'm as bad as that preacher wants me to think I am. That's the last time we went to that church, you know. But you've heard this stuff as well. You know, you've heard it as well. And because of these things, you see, people in the church today, many of them, are simply unable to be the kind of Christians that they really want to be. These people are not lazy. They're not uncaring about their faith. They just feel like they're not good enough for God. And I want to ask you again, can you relate to that? Can you relate? To, do you feel that way about yourself? How many times have we talked about, and I've talked to people over the years about when we die, you know, do you know you're going to heaven? Do you know that? And Christians who have been in the church all their lives will go, well, I sure hope so, and I cringe. <laughs> what do you mean you hope so? The Bible says Jesus Christ died and rose again, that we can be forgiven, and that our election is sure. That if you believe in Jesus Christ and you confess your sins and you confess Him as Lord and Savior, heaven's a done deal. You don't need to worry about heaven. And one of my favorite things is, oh, I really freak people out. I will say to people, you know, I'm your pastor, but I'm really not concerned about whether you get to heaven or not. Oh my gosh, you ought to see what they say. And the reason I say that is because I, I follow it with this. I am your pastor, and I care about your relationship with God right now. I believe I care about how much God is blessing you and how, you, how much you're allowing God to come into your life and how much you're worshiping Him and praising Him every day. Because if you're doing that, we don't need to worry about heaven. It's all about, we're not doing the right things just to get to heaven one day. 
I'm not at all concerned about whether I'm going to heaven or not. I'm concerned about the level of my faith now and, and experiencing and enjoying my God right today and every day and walking with Him. And when I do that, heaven's going to happen. I don't need to be concerned about it. Yeah, yeah. But you see, because of the problems that we have, because of our, our damaged spiritual self-image, many people are unable to live out that faith even though they want to. And like I said, these people are not lazy or uncaring. They just feel like they're not good enough. I believe there's a crisis in our church today. And that crisis is with our church members who have lost their spiritual identity, their spiritual self-image, if you will, and they just have no idea how to recover it. You know, the Bible tells us that we were created in God's image and that God has called us good. Let me explain that. Listen closely. Stay with me on this one. What does that mean? That means that God created each of us and when God created, not, not just Christians, not just people, not just God of the world, put your name in there. Okay, let's talk directly about you and me. Okay? When you and I were born, God put within us the same qualities that God has. God gave us his qualities, not just to enjoy, but also so that we can share them with him and with other people. And these are qualities of God that reflect who God is in and through each one of us. For example, when we see someone in distress and we go to help them, that's the quality of compassion. When we laugh with the laughter of a child, that is the quality of joy. When we experience pain because someone else has experienced pain, that is the quality of empathy. Now, there are many non-believers who, when they experience these qualities they, in their own lives, they think they're just being nice people and they're being good people. And they are, but it's actually God who has planted these qualities inside every single person. It is God working through us, working through us as Christians and even non-believers. God is working through us to reach out to other people with the love of God. And like I said, there are many people today who don't even realize that God is messing around in their lives and that God is empowering them to be his hands and feet, even if they may not acknowledge. We talked about King Cyrus last week, right? God used him mightily, and he, God even said, even though you don't even acknowledge me, I'm still using you. And that's what God does for us too. Have you ever thought about that? that you actually have the qualities of God himself embedded deep inside you because you were created in God's image. Have you ever thought about, and I think here's the part that we really need to hear, that God loves you so much that when you lost your spiritual self-identity, he gave his life for you to restore his identity within you so that now, when God looks at you, what he sees are his qualities in you. Friends, you were created in God's image, and God has pronounced you good. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to share a story with you about a family who was traveling. And it was a husband and wife and a one-year-old child, a little boy named Eric. And around noon on the highway, they, they got off the interstate, and they, they stopped at a diner in a small town. And while they were looking over the menu, the parents heard Eric squealing with glee from a high chair. And his face was alive with excitement, and he was screaming, hi there, hi there, to the top of his lungs, you can imagine. And as mom turned around to see who he was talking to, her heart sank to her feet. The source of Eric's excitement was a man with a tattered old coat that was greasy and worn. Baggy pants covered his spindly, sickly-looking legs, and a bare toes poked out of what were shoes at one time, and simply stated he was unwashed, uncombed, and unshaven, and Eric's mother could even smell him way over at her table. Well, this dirty, worn old man was, was waving his bony arms high in the air at Eric, and he was yelling back, going, hi there, hi there, I see you. you know, and, and, and Eric continued to wave and call back to the man, hi there. 
Eric's mom turned the high chair around away from the man, you know. However, Eric kept twisting around and squirming and, and squealing to see his newfound buddy. Well, obviously the man had been drinking, and no one in the diner appreciated this at all about what was going on, that you can imagine. Eric's dad was humiliated. His mom was totally embarrassed. So they ate quickly and silently, except for Eric, who continued to laugh and coo at the old man. Well, they finished their meal, and they paid the check, and they started for the door, but there was a problem. The old man was sitting at a table that was between them and the door. Now, how were they going to get out of here? Ma, Eric's mom just started praying, you know, that j Lord, just get us out of here somehow. So she turned her back, she held her breath, and she started for the door, but it was way too late. Eric was leaning out of his mother's arms as they got closer, and the old man looked up and he said, Ma'am, may I please hold your baby? Yeah. And before she could respond, Eric leaped and propelled himself into this man's arms and immediately laid his face on this old man's dirty, ragged shoulder. As the old man sat there holding Eric, his mom could see tears in his eyes. His old hands, full of dirt from years of hard work, gently cradled Eric and patted his back. And after just a few seconds, this man opened his eyes, and he looked at Eric's mom, and he said, This is a precious baby. Please take good care of him. And the old man slowly and firmly pried Eric's, Eric from his chest and placed him back in his mother's arms. And he said, God bless you, ma'am, for giving me the greatest present I've ever received. Friends, let me ask you a question. What did Eric see in this tattered, rejected old man that no one else wanted to see or no one else could see? What made Eric leap out of his mother's arms into the arms of an old man and lay his head on a dirty shoulder? Friends, I'm going to tell you the answer to that. Eric saw the same thing in that old man that God sees every day in you and me. Eric saw the image of God. The image of God that has been planted in you and me by God himself. And that is why, you see, whatever you've done, and hear this, listen to this stuff, whatever you've done in your life, however you may have lived your life in the past, no matter what, and here's the big one, no matter what people or circumstances have tried to tell you that you are, God is telling you right here, right now, that when God looks at you, he sees his own image. When God looks at you, he sees your beauty and he sees your strength. He sees the beautiful, strong person he created you to be. Oh, my friends, you, you may feel like you're dirty and tattered and broken. You may feel like you're abandoned and all alone and, and maybe even not worthy for God. You may feel, you know, may not feel good about who you are or things that you've done in the past. And you may even feel rejected like the old man in the story. But hear this, friends. Hear this this morning. Your God loves you. And when God looks at you, he sees the beauty he created in you. And God calls you good. Somebody's supposed to say amen there. Amen. Okay. In a few moments, in a few moments, we're going to join together and receive this wonderful gift of Holy Communion, a gift that God has brought to us today. And, and as we come, as we prepare, don't be concerned about if you should or should not participate. Don't be concerned about whether you're good enough to participate or maybe you're not. Jesus, you know, Jesus doesn't say, come to me, all of you who have your act together, and I'll reward you for being so good. No, he doesn't say that. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are tired burdened and broken come to me all of you who are messed up and messed over and i will give you rest i will restore you i will make you whole again friends no matter what you may think you look like before god god is telling you right here this morning come to this table and meet me the one who created you in my image come and meet me 
the one who calls you blessed. Come and meet me, the one who calls you my child. And come and meet me, the one who gave my life so that you can have eternal life with me. Receive your healing and your rest this morning. And then go from this place blessed. Go forgiven. Go having been made whole from your brokenness, your pain, and your sin. And go to share your life and share God's love with others. Let others not only see the image of God in you, but let others see in you a beacon that points to him. Friends, you have been made in God's image. God created you as you are. And every day God calls you good. Amen. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you for this reminder from you this morning. This reminder of who we really are. This reminder of how much you love us. And Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you pour out upon us each and every day. Lord, when the world tells us we're not good enough, when the world tells us we're not strong enough or smart enough or all the other things that they try to convince us of, help us to just turn a blind ear to it. And help us, Lord, to keep our eyes focused on you and know that in your eyes, which is really all that matters, you have created us. You sustain us every day. You love us every day. When you look at us, you see your image, your image of grace and love. And each day anew, you call us good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for being our God. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we receive this gift of communion, I'm going to ask, does anyone, has anyone not received a little communion cup? Does anyone not have it? And we'll get it to you real quick. No? Good, good. Gus, you did a good job. <laughs> Getting it out to everyone. <sighs> what can I say about what God has spoken to us about this morning? I mean, what else needs to be said? I mean, it's amazing when God reaches down to us and, and I don't know about you, but I'm a little hard-headed. And sometimes I think, God, oh, have I got your attention now? You know, and, but you need to hear me. You need to listen to what I'm saying to you. Don't listen to everything that the world is saying. The world has got a lot of crazy stuff going on right now. Don't listen to all that. Stay above it. Stay close to me. Keep your eyes focused on me every single day, no matter what's going on around you. I will never steal you wrong. He never has, and he never will. He's, what does the Bible say? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pretty simple stuff. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this, you know. We can all understand it's simply that God loves you and me. And when we come to this table, we're not going to physically come to the table today because of the COVID restrictions and everything, but when we come to this time of Holy Communion, Holy Communion is not about us. Some churches say, you know, you've got to, you, like our Roman Catholic friends, they say that you need to confess your sins to the priest or you're not, you're not, your communion is not available to you. And that's what they believe. And uh, the church I grew up in, unless you were a member of the church, you weren't able to receive. One of the things I love about our United Methodist theology and what we believe is that Holy Communion is not about how good we are or whether we qualify. Holy Communion is totally all about God. God reaching down to his people who he created and who he loves to pour out his grace upon them and to show them his love. And our role is simply to respond to God's love by receiving this gift of bread and this wine. That's the way it works. It's not about how good we are because, frankly, I'm not good enough I'm not worthy to receive Holy Communion. I'm not. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just as you are. But because of his death and resurrection, he has made us worthy. <laughs> In spite of ourselves, he's made us worthy. And that's why we can come to this table and we can receive this gift from God and we can receive his grace poured out upon us. And we can know that we are loved, cherished children of God himself. Now, one thing I want to say before we, we partake of communion 
if you're not a member of this church or of any church, and I've had people do this, they're wondering, can I do this or not? Can I participate? I don't know how they do it here, you know, that kind of thing. I just want to clear that up real quick. As we've been saying, God is not concerned about whether you're a church member or not right now. There's only one thing that matters. Did God create you? Does God love you? Does God want to pour his grace out upon you? Yes, he does. So if you have any hesitation about whether you're allowed to come or whether you should come, the very simple answer is yes, please. Please come to this table. Enjoy God's grace during this time and let it be a time of renewal and refreshment for you as well. We remember on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he was in the upper room with his disciples and during the Passover meal that they were celebrating, he broke the bread. He held it in front of them and broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. My body broken for you. And when the meal was over, the way they celebrated then, they didn't, everybody didn't have their own cup. They had a common cup with the wine, and, and the host would pass it. And so Jesus picked up the, the wine, and instead of just simply passing it, he blessed it. And he said to them, as he says to us, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Come and receive this, all of you. Receive this gift of forgiveness and healing and grace and continue to receive it as often as you can until my Father returns and we dine together at his holy table. The bread, the cup, gifts from God to you and me, gifts of blessing and gifts of grace. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to answer your call and come to this holy table and meet you. As we said earlier, Lord, we know that as sinners we're not worthy, but because of your grace and because of your forgiveness, you have told us clearly you have made us worthy. We are your children and we are your beloved people. And so, Father, we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful gift this morning, this gift of love, this gift of grace being poured out upon us from you as we come to this table. And so, Lord, we ask that you'll send your Holy Spirit right now to be on this gift of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that as we are renewed and refreshed in your love, we will truly know that we have been blessed today and that we will go from this place enjoying your grace and your love and your strength every day and that others will see you in us and that we will truly be a beacon of light that points this lost and hurting world to Jesus. Thank you for this gift now, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, but if you, if you pick up your little thing of communion, right on the top there's a tab, you peel it back, and you'll find a wafer in there. That's your bread. And then there's another tab under that. You peel that one back and you get to the juice. And again, we, we, this is all uncomfortable for us, we know, but it's the best we can do at this point with the COVID restrictions. And we'll be so happy when we get back to the normal way that we receive communion. So receive the blood, the bread, the body of Christ, the juice, his blood. Receive this and be thankful. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Closing hymn is a praise song that, that we've been singing for years, and I think it is so appropriate. After we have been blessed by God this morning and we have been renewed in his love, I don't think of anything better to sing than he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Let's stand together and sing. The words will be on your screen, and it's number 177 in your hymnal, and we will sing it through twice. Let's stand and, and just acknowledge and praise our God, just if for nothing else and just for what he's done here for us this morning. Let's praise him.
thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Thank you for being part of our very special homecoming celebration today. I thank you again for, for being here and for, uh, for worshiping and for listening and for being part of this service. I pray that God has spoken to you, that he's touched your heart in a very special way, that he's kind of renewed his commitment to you this morning about how much he loves you and that he has empowered you to be his people, to go wherever he calls you to go. So now as you leave here, go in his strength, go in his might, go in his love, and go in his grace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.